have a good number here. It's this is being recorded. So if you joined late, you can just uh, pick up this first part, the introductory part. My name is um, John Nicholson. I work at Alltech as a senior environmental engineer and jack of all trades. Um, with us today is Paul Manning and Elham. I'm going to do the introductions. Um, so Paul works at Manning Environmental Law. It's a leading Canadian environmental law firm based in downtown Toronto. His website is manningenvironmentallaw.com, I believe. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. So if you need to find more information to him, he is a, and I want to make sure I get this right, Paul. Is it certified environmental law specialist? Yes, yeah, certified by the Law Society. Yeah, by the Upper Law Society, Law Society of Upper Canada. Yes, now the Law Society of Ontario. Okay, Law Society. I like the old one, but that's fine. Fair enough. <laughs> so he's that. wealth experience. I've worked with Paul for many years. I've known him for a long time. So that's why we have him here because of his uh, expertise. And also with us is uh, Elham Garuhi. And Elham, did I pronounce your last name right? She must be on route. That is correct. That's cool. All right, close enough. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Elham is a professional engineer uh, in the province of Ontario. She also has a master's degree in chemical engineering and has over 15 years of a professional experience, um, process engineering, complex project management in the fields of environmental compliance, air dispersion modeling environmental systems design, construction, wastewater treatment, air pollution control systems. So I think, not to, not to brag, but I think we have some two very qualified people who are gonna have more than enough capability to speak. So I'm gonna hand over the meeting, put my, oh, the other, some housekeeping matters. If you have a question, hold it till the end so we can make sure we get through the presentations. Alternatively, you can use the chat function. So if you put your mouse button down to the bottom, there's a chat feature. You can add it to the chat. You can ask a question of everyone or just to the particular speakers. And at the end of the two um, presentations, Paul's gonna be anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes and uh, Elham's gonna be I don't know, up to 20 minutes. So we'll have time at the end for questions and answers. Um, but we're going to save those to the end to make sure we get through the presentation. So you can either jot it down and type it in and we'll do it that way. So in an orderly fashion. So Paul, take it away with your presentation. So hopefully that is going to be. Oh. Okay. So, um, I'm hoping that you all can see, have I shared it, my presentation adequately? I can see it perfectly, Paul. Okay, Mastery of the Technology, that's, uh, that's Webinar 101, and it repays our, our excellent dry run yesterday. Um, so, as you heard, I'm Paul Manning, my firm is Manning Environmental Law, we're based in downtown Toronto, and we do principally environmental law and as subsidiaries of that we do uh, a lot to do with uh, energy law, some urban planning law and also indigenous law, all of which um, to my mind falls under the umbrella of environmental law. You heard that I'm a specialist um, in environmental law certified by the Law Society and you've got my, uh, my uh, website there and um, and for all the expertise that has been accredited to me by John's kind words, mine is going to be more of a legal overview and you'll find that um, Elham's excellent presentation, which is to come, goes into uh, more detail on some of these issues. So I'm trying to give the legal framework and then you'll hear more detail um, from Elham as we go along. So first of all, and um, a lot of this may be known to people, but uh, it helps to build up the framework. For air emissions in Ontario, there are two uh, primary pieces of legislation. One is the Environmental Protection Act, 
and the other is the uh, regulation made under that Act 41905, uh, which I'm going to call the regulation for most of the time. And um, under one of the main things you have to do under the Environmental Protection Act is um, if you're running a facility that has equipment that is uh, likely to emit contaminants to the uh, natural environment, you're going to either have to get um, an, a what used to be called a certificate of approval air, or indeed a certificate of approval air and noise, if noise and vibration is an issue for you, uh, and now is known as an environmental compliance approval. Uh, but um, whereas you always used to have to obtain an environmental compliance approval, uh, now there are a series of activities that are so well known in their environmental effect that you uh, only have to register those on the Environmental Activity and Sector Registry. And that's known for short, as I'm sure most everyone on this webinar will know, it's known as an ESA. And apart from mentioning those two items, I'm going to leave it to Elham's presentation to drill down into some of the detail on those uh, two approvals and what you need for that, when you have to apply, when you need to register. Um, and uh, so I'm going to move on to the regulation. So you have to comply in addition to the Environmental Protection Act, you have to comply with the requirements of Ontario Regulation 41905, and I'm referring to that as the regulation. There are, I should add, a whole host of other obligations that you need to comply with under the Environmental Protection Act. Uh, certainly you need to report uh, excessive discharges to the environment, and I'm going to touch on that uh, on my last slide when I get to that. So the regulation, um, the regulation limits concentrations of contaminants caused by air emissions from a facility. And those concentrations, how are they calculated? Well, they're calculated at points of impingement uh, and a number of points of impingement are selected and the concentrations must be less than the relevant standard, which is in the regulation um, at any POI, point of impingement. And there are three ways in which a facility can comply depending on the emissions or depending on what kind of industry you are. So the first primary one is that you have to meet the standards prescribed in the regulation. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more because we're going to get to the news, what has changed quite shortly. And that is going to talk about air standards and the way in which one demonstrates compliance. Um, if you have going to have difficulty complying with the standard, then you can request uh, and hopefully receive a site specific standard uh, when you have to jump through a series of hoops um, to be able to demonstrate that um, it's appropriate for you to have a site specific standard rather than complying with the general standards. And uh, if you get that, then you just have to comply with that site specific standard. In addition, uh, if you are um, one of a certain series of designated industries and foundries is one, there are others which are specified in the regulation, uh, or if you have a certain specific type of equipment generally related to those kind of industries, then you can register and meet a technical standard. And there's a number of standards which are um, have been designated by the ministry, the Ministry of uh, Environment, Conservation and Parks, MECP. And uh, if you're in such an industry, then you would be able to register for and comply with those standards instead of the general uh, standards that I was referring to earlier. So you've worked out that you're a, you're an, a facility that um, has discharge of contaminants to the air. You've obtained hopefully your environmental compliance approval and or registered your ESA, depending on what operation or piece of equipment we're talking about. Um, you've 
chosen, if that's the right word, your compliance approach, you've worked out which is appropriate for your facility. And then how do you demonstrate that you are complying with your standard? Well, in my last bullet on this page, you'll see that the facility must develop an emissions summary and dispersion modeling report, EDSM, forgive me, it's ESDM, there's a typo there, uh, to demonstrate compliance. So what's that all about, uh, ESDM reports? Well, an ESDM report summarizes all the emissions from the facility. Just going to adjust my pictures there. Uh, uh, and uses air dispersion mo models, which can be used on their own or combined with air monitoring data, actual monitoring, to assess compliance. So when you need to use an EDSM report, and I think I've got this typo <laughs> perpetually through my presentation, ESDM report, um, uh, so you must uh, prepare such a report if you're applying for an environmental compliance approval, which we've discussed, if you're applying for a site-specific standard, which exceeds an upper risk, risk threshold, and those are thresholds which are defined in the regulation. If the ministry make a request to you to prepare such a report, then you're going to have to do that. And if you're a, in a sector, can I just, so I think I pulled this on. Sorry, I'm, I'm my technological mastery has uh, has fallen by the wayside here. Um, so in the last situation, if you're uh, in a sector listed in Schedule 4 or 5 of the regulation, then uh, you also have to prepare a report. The reports must be updated annually. That's not crystal clear from a reading of the regulation, but that's actually how the Ministry interpret it and more importantly, how they enforce it. Uh, the report must be accurate as at the December the 31st in the year the report was prepared. And if it needs to be updated, then it must be, that update must be completed no later than March the 31st in the following year. So we've got a, a gone through fairly quickly those slides because that's a build up to what is the purpose of this um, of this webinar? And the purpose, apart from giving uh, a context and, and an environmental regulatory overview to how air emissions are regulated, it we have a little bit of news that back in February the first of this year, uh, there was a change to say that there that all facilities now have to comply with these standards in Schedule Three of the regulation and that has the end game that is the end game of what has been a 10 year uh, staged uh, phased uh, introduction of these standards so this year is the first year when all facilities have to comply with schedule 3 concentrations also um, the air dispersion models which you can use have changed the old regulation 346 um, air dispersion models have been phased out and you can now choose from screen three or air mod to assess compliance with the air standards in the schedule. And uh, you must also use the ASHRAE method to assess, to assess same structure contamination. So any facilities, if you have a facility where you had to submit an application for an environmental compliance approval, um, on or after February the 1st, 2019, then you, um, then, then you were already asked to demonstrate compliance uh, using the new standards and using the advanced models. Um, and so new ESDM annual reports and annual updates for 2020 and thereafter must comply with the Schedule 3 standards and use the new air dispersion models. So what if you exceed the new standards? The problem with this is you may have been going along very comfortably uh, 
complying with um, old standards and, and using old air dispersion models. And then you get to this year and you are having to introduce or rather use uh, new air dispersion models um, to prepare your ESDM reports. And also you have to comply with new schedule three standards. And if you find that you're not in compliance or otherwise your um, air emissions are causing an adverse effect, an adverse effect is a, an expression that is defined at some length in the uh, Environmental Protection Act, if you're doing either of those things, then you have to go through a number of steps. Firstly, you have to notify the ministry immediately. That's under section 28 of the regulation. And then you have to submit 30 days after that a written abatement plan recommending steps to prevent and minimize discharges. And if uh, we mentioned the upper risk threshold in one of the previous slides, if that is uh, likely to be exceeded, then you immediately have to notify the ministry and submit uh, an ESDM report for that contaminant within three months time. So those are very um, strict uh, obligations um, and you have to do those promptly. If you fail to do it, then you may be prosecuted for an offence. And, um, and so it's important to get those things dealt with very swiftly. And indeed, therefore, you need most likely an environmental consultant, uh, such as Altec, to assist you with doing all that to ensure your compliance, to make sure that you're, you've got all your reports up to date, that you're complying with the Schedule 3 standards using the correct um, air modeling uh, approaches and, um, and making sure that if you do have any uh, discrepancy, that if there is an exceedance, then you're complying with the notification and abatement rules immediately. Um, and notification is quite a theme in the environmental legislation. And I've noted in my last bullet here that uh, there's um, in a prohibition on discharges of contaminants above regulated levels in section six of the Environmental Protection Act. So when I talk about regulated levels, that's a level specified by a regulation and the level specified by the regulation here is the schedule three standards. Uh, so there's in addition to the uh, requirements to notify MECP of uh, a, a situation where you may exceed Schedule 3 standards. If you do exceed Schedule 3 standards, you're going to have to notify uh, the Ministry under Section 13. So you may find yourself in contravention of uh, three different bits of, of legislation. Firstly, if you fail to notify no, firstly, if you're, if you're not complying with Schedule 3 standards under the regulation. Secondly, if you fail to notify and abate in the way that I've just described under the regulation. And also um, for having discharged um, a contaminant into the air, which is above the Schedule 3 standards and fail to notify it, you may find yourself at the wrong end of all sorts of potential offences and having to deal with the enforcement uh, branch of the ministry. So it's extremely important to make sure that your air assessment is up to date. Um, if you have the in-house uh, competence to be able to do all these things, then that's uh, terrific. But most, uh, most industrial and similar clients will need a consultant such as Alltech to assist them uh, in negotiating what is otherwise quite a a quite a minefield of uh, compliance. Um, so that's, uh, you already heard my biography. Doesn't say that I got a swimming certificate for 25 yards when I was at school, but uh, apart from that, and that is my uh, contact information where you can get hold of me if uh, there's anything of a professional nature that I can assist with. And with that, I've tried to keep up a fair pace to make sure there's time not only for LM's uh, presentation, uh, which you're going to find more useful than mine, I dare say, um, but also to allow a little time for questions if we have it at the end. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, if you joined late, just some housekeeping matters. Uh, we record. We are recording this, so if you're a participant and you joined late, um, you'll be able to access the recordings and also the presentations. Those who request a copy of it, hard copies or email copies, will get those out. Uh, and then again, with respect to questions, either save them till the end or add them to chat. You can send them directly to me or to Paul and to, um, or Elham. I already have some, some people sent them to me, so, but we're gonna save them. So there's some really good questions here, legal questions that you'll <laughs> wanna stay to the end. It's about getting charged and convicted, which is always people's mm -hmm. worry. Uh, okay, so let's keep moving. Uh, Elham is next. And um, while she's loading up her presentation, I'm proud to say that we spent some time practicing to make this as seamless as um, possible. So Elham, if you can load up your presentation, and you'll definitely want to watch this because it's uh, multimedia and it has some video to it. Oh, I think you need to unmute yourself, Elham. Elham, you're on mute. So can you see the presentation? Yes, I can. Okay, yeah, great. it looks great. Great, thank you, John. Uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and thank you, Paul. We're glad to have Paul online and he addressed all the legal requirements and the changes in terms of the legal standpoints. We will talk about the uh, changes in terms of the uh, affection of these uh, changes in, to the facilities and uh, understanding the requirements of the air permitting. Sorry, uh, can you see the presentation now? I can cool? see it fine. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's a person yeah, on a dock. Good. Is it showing the second page? I'm not sure. It if did it's show and then it bounced back. So right now it's the intro and then I saw the second page which was a person sitting on a dock in a bubble. Was that the <laughs> <second> page? <laughs> I'm not sure. Oh, it looked like a really scenic picture. Okay, let me. Can you see it now? I think some something. I will stop sharing and start sharing again. That's not my dog, for the record. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's that's my dog, dog. Paul. That's my dog. I'm embarrassed. Uh, no worry. No worries. Yeah, we're all socially distanced if anyone's worried. Very socially distanced. You're in Toronto. I'm in Mississauga and Elham is in uh, at the office uh, near the DVP. Well, the dog is in the other room, if that's, uh, if that's reassuring. What kind of dog is it? It's uh, a wire fox terrier. Sounds like um, a fast dog. <laughs> he, well, it, it refer, refers to the hair. He's not wild. Oh, okay. In any in any sense. Okay. <laughs> All right. I have a um I have a um what kind of dog do I have? Shih Tzu mix. Very nice. So he'll probably be barking. Although the mailman already came. So he um Oh, let's do the questions. I said till the end, but we might as well do the, some Good questions. Plan. They were legal. Good plan. And okay. maybe Paul. So we're waiting for Elham on her technical problems. Um, okay. So one question was with respect to the three options, you know, you meet the reg. Yes. Like, yes, yes. With respect to the site specific standard. So you asked the ministry, hey, can we have a site specific standard under for our environmental compliance approval? Um, do you, a couple of questions under that was, do you have any idea how many of those are issue, have been issued in Ontario? Are they a rarity or somewhat common? And then secondly, 
are they based on a toxicology assessment similar to, you know, contaminate sites, how you can get a site specific one or best available technology similar to the states or a combination of those? Do you know that? Those two. It's um, so some of those are, are sort of like practical questions that um, um, that Elham might be better placed. I, I don't know the exact I don't know the exact figures. I don't have the statistics. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that it's not um, it by no means rare, but you have to be able to demonstrate it. I don't think it's uh, uh, toxicology as such. I think you just have to demonstrate that there are good practical reasons why you're unable to comply mm -hmm. and why compliance non, um, compliance with the standard you've selected nonetheless would not have an adverse impact. That's how I understand it. Uh, I'm seeing that um, Elham is back online. Yes, sorry, sorry, sorry for the problem. Okay, you ready? Um, you so I'm just part. saying, Elham, we, we dealt with a, we dealt with a, a question and it was a question how frequently are there site specific standards and I didn't have the statistics but but it's not infrequent to get a site specific standard and as I understand yes. and you have to you have to demonstrate to the ministry why it's uh, for uh, good sound practical reasons it's not possible to comply but why non-compliance or rather why compliance with your selected standard would nonetheless not have an adverse environmental effect so how does that go in practice when you have to deal with a site specific standard? It is very complicated process. The ministry consultation is required and all uh, steps that is uh, need to be demonstrated to the ministry why this uh, specific site uh, can, uh, cannot uh, meet those limits. And so the ministry involvement is, is the key point here. And, and as I understand it, you have to demonstrate to the Ministry's satisfaction that the standard you selected in place of the general standard nonetheless would not have um, uh, an adverse environmental effect of any significance. Yes. Is, is, okay. Um, so, so should we, sorry, forgive me, go ahead, go ahead. I will continue, sorry for the problem. So before starting, I want to talk about uh, Altec. So uh, my name is Elham Guruhi, and I'm from Altec Environmental Consulting, LTD. Uh, Altec is part of the, its parent company, Char Technologies. Char is an environmental consulting and technology firm, and we offer different services in permitting and compliance and property due diligence, resource efficiency, and advanced industrial clean technologies for air, water, and waste, and renewable energy. So if you want to reach to uh, us about any of these areas, you can directly reach to John or me after this webinar if you have any questions. The objectives of this webinar are to learn about the air and noise permit types and the permitting process in Ontario and uh, you will be introduced to the air contaminants concentration standards uh, that applies to all Ontario facilities as of February 1st, 2020. And to understand what steps need to be taken to ensure compliance with the new requirements under Ontario Regulation 41905. And we will provide you with an example of industrial facilities compliance before and after February 1st, 2020. We want to run a poll to uh, know more about you and the sector you represent. Please choose a sector that best describes your facility or processes. I'll give you time to answer. We are still receiving answers.
It looks like that most of the participants are from general manufacturing uh, sector. Paul already explained changes before and after February 1st, and this slide will summarize some of them here. Uh, before February 1st, a Schedule 2 standards uh, apply to some facilities and a Schedule 3 standards applies to some other facilities. After February 1st, most facilities, uh, all, all facilities are required to be in compliance with the Schedule 3 standards, which is more stringent. Before February 1st, uh, the emission limits were based on half an hour and one hour averaging periods. Now, all facilities must have the 24 hour or one hour averaging periods for their emission limits. The emissions were higher, limits were higher before February 1st. Now it is lower. For example, the nitrogen oxide had a half an hour limit of 500 microgram per cubic meter. Now it has uh, 400 for uh, 24 hour and one, uh, and 400 for one hour and 200 for 24 hour. Before February 1st, uh, a very simple anterior regulation 346 air dispersion model was applied to facilities. Now all facilities are required to use more stringent air dispersion model, which could be air mod or screen tree or ashtray model. With all these changes, facilities that were in compliance using older air dispersion model and a schedule to standards or limits might now be out of compliance. What does this mean for facilities? So if a facility was in compliance with section 19, depending on the permit type, running a screening mo model to show the compliance or ESDM report update, or applying for a new air permit amendment is required. We will talk about the air permit update because it is a complete process that includes all the steps. Note that not all facilities are required to apply for a new permit time. So the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks has two approval types, ECAs or environmental compliance approvals and ESERs or environmental activity and sector registry. ECAs are designed for businesses that may cause more potential adverse effect to the environment. Businesses with less complex operations may register themselves online on the ESER. Ministry has different ESER types. Most of them do not require assessing of the air emissions. And as long as the facility falls under the requirement for that ESER, they are eligible to register. Ministry also introduced a new ESER in 2017 called Air Emissions ESER. This ESER is designed for industrial facilities with multiple processes that can discharge contaminants to the atmosphere, but the processes are less complex or may pose less potential adverse effect to the environment. This new ESER process is uh, faster because the registration is online and the ministry review is not required. To register a licensed engineering practitioner or LEP is required to sign and stamp the reports and states its accuracy. It will also help ministry to maintain their one year service time for ECA applications. So how do we identify which permit type does apply to a facility? The first step is to determine the facility's NAICS code. A NAICS code is a classification within the North American industry classification system based on the operation types. Then we will compare the NAICS code to the uh, Ontario Regulation 117 or ESER regulation. If the NAICS code found in the ESER schedule, then the facility is not eligible for the ESER. If not, we will review the facility for processes that are easily excluded. Example of these processes are electroplating or gas turbines or outdoor metal processing or some outdoors activities. And there are some other processes that are not listed here. If none of those processes are included in the facility, then the facility is eligible for the easier. Otherwise, an ECA application is required. Once we determine the air permit type for the facility, we will take the below steps to apply for the permits. 
The first step is to review all the processes and our operations that are producing air emissions. I included some examples of the processes here uh, that are producing air emissions, like combustion processes. All facilities have combustion equipment like HVACs or boilers. Paint boosters, they're producing emissions, including PM emissions and VOC emissions, or some other VOC emissions from chemical consumptions like sanitation chemical consumption. Soldering emissions from soldering operations and PM emissions from cutting, regrinding, or welding, and etc. Or some facilities have cooling towers, and the cooling tower emissions should be considered in the air emissions as well. We also need to review processes and operations that are producing noise or vibration emissions. Rooftop fans are example of the processes that, that are producing noise emissions, as well as HVAC equipment. Some truck activities and material handlings are very noisy and producing noise emissions. Also, emergency gen generators are part of the noise emitting equipment. After that, we have to uh, determine the worst case scenario for the facility. The worst case could be a maximum production per day or maximum material consumption per day. It could be the maximum operating hours per day or any other worst case condition that applies to the facility. And why should we consider the worst case scenario? Because the production rate and manufacturing activities vary depending on the demand and customer orders, and they're not consistent day to day. So if, if we are able to show compliance for the worst case scenario for the facility, then the compliance for the other scenarios are also evident. Then we have to uh, calculate the emission rates for the facility and for each process based on emission uh, factors or engineering calculation or mass balances. Consider a facility that uses 500 kilogram per hour of raw material. By doing engineering calculation, we determine that two and a half gram per second of this raw material is emitting to the atmosphere through the stack. After calculating the emission rates, the air dispersion modeling needs to be done for the plant. By applying to air permit, a facility tells ministry that contaminant concentration outside of the property boundary meets the limits. That's why dispersion modeling comes into play. By doing the dispersion modeling, we determine the concentration of the contaminant at the point that it hits the ground after traveling through the atmosphere. This is called point of impingement or POI concentration. If the uh, POI concentration meets the ministry limits, then we will prepare the ESCM report and all other requirements under ECA or ESER and will register the facility to the ECA or ESER. If not, the POI concentration exceeds the ministry limits. We have to refine the calculation based on the facility updated information, or uh, some facilities may need, uh, require air pollution control technologies to reduce the emissions. To refine the cal calculation, we can revise worst case scenario, or some facilities decide to cease using a specific problematic chemical or replace it with other chemicals. It is also very critical here that the facilities provide the information as accurate as possible uh, to uh, streamline the process and avoid any delays. This is an example of a plant with different emission sources, idling truck, emergency generator, and manufacturing operations. All emissions from these sources are determined using emission rate calculation, and then we perform the air dispersion modeling to determine the maximum concentration outside of the property boundary. As you can see, the pollutant concentration decreases with distance due to dilution and dispersion into the air. As such, sources that have more distance to the property boundary will potentially have less POI concentrations. The ministry's approved air dispersion model that needs to be used for most facilities to show compliance with the Schedule 3 standard is AirMod. AirMod is a Gaussian steady state plume model, which is developed by US EPA and adopted by MECP. The mathematical model is shown in the left-hand side. 
The, this picture shows that how plume extends and disperses through the atmosphere on the wind direction. The right hand side movie is the output of the AirMod computer software. The plume intensity is shown by contouring colors. The movie is created to show variation of plume over time in an hourly basis. The actual meteorological data and land, uh, use, land space data is used in the dispersion model. As you can see, the plume direction and length and intensity changes over time, depending on the actual weather conditions. The highest PUI concentration resulted from running five years weather data for the facility will be reported as the highest PUI concentration for that contaminant. Uh, I, I just want to add that this is our office building. We, we just developed a model to show that the, how the plume changes over time. Now we want to present a case study of a facility in Ontario. This facility is a plastic manufacturing facility. It has VOC emissions from extrusion and molding activities. It has PM emissions from regrinding, vacuum pumps, and cooling towers. And it has combustion equipment, and the emissions from combustion equipment are also sources of emission. The facility has an ECA uh, permit based on a Schedule 2 standards and Section 19 of the regulation. And the air, uh, air dispersion model was completed using Ontario Regulation 346 model. And the facility was in compliance with all these requirements. After February 1st, the facility made no changes to their processes and operations. The worst case scenario was considered the same as previous, the one that was listed in their previous ECA application. And the emission rates converted to a 24 hour period based on their operating conditions. A Schedule 3 area standards used to uh, determine the compliance and the air model dispersion model used to uh, show the dispersion. The results showed that some con uh, contaminants have emissions over uh, ministry limits, uh, Schedule 3 ministry limits, with, even with no changes in their processes. So what steps have we taken to ensure compliance for this plan? First step was to revisit the worst case scenario with facility collaboration. After revisiting the worst case scenario, we understood that this scenario was considered very conservatively and, and that case will never happen at this facility. It was assumed that all molding machines are operating at 100% capacity at the same time. This assumption was revised based on facil by facility consultation and the calculations were refined based on the new operating conditions. We performed the air dispersion modeling and the out of compliance components uh, decreased from six to one. They still had one component, total VOC, which was still over the negligibility limits. I just want to clarify that the total VOC doesn't have ministerial limit, but it has negligibility limits. So if such substance is over negligibility threshold, a toxicology assessment is required. In this case, it was not possible to perform a tox assessment because the total VOC is not a single substance and its uh, component vary depending on the source. So the facility had two options, to install an air pollution control technology to reduce the total VOC amount to below the negligibility amount, or there was another option to especiate the total VOC into its components by lab analysis or research data. We chose the second uh, option and we were able to speciate the VOC content based on the resin, uh, resins that they were, they were using. And the results showed that the speciated uh, components are all within ministerial limits. So the facility was in compliance with these new operating conditions. Uh, and uh, the, we were able to register them to the ESER because the facility was eligible for the ESER. I just want to note that this new operating condition that we revised their worst case scenario was listed in their ESTM report as their limit. So in future, if they want to increase their production or change operating condition, a new assessment needs to be done. 
This is a demonstration of the air mod modeling for another client. We show the facility anonymously to protect the client's information. So the quality of the video might be affected by the Zoom. I just want to give a heads up. But uh, if you want to have the full video, uh, we will be able to provide. So let me. Now we would like to present you a case study on air dispersion modeling for a manufacturing facility in Toronto, Ontario. Here we have a facility located inside an industrial park. The property boundary for this facility is the green line shown here. Let us switch over to the AirMod model itself. Before running the AirMod model, we need to set up building envelope, emission sources, and the receptor grid. We can define the exact property boundary based on local zoning maps. The multi-tiered receptor grid consists of over a thousand green points shown here. The receptors are spaced out based on their distance from the property boundary. Emission sources are added to the model based on actual stack location, with parameters including exit flow rate, temperature, stack height, etc. We have completed the first step. Now, let's move on to another important aspect of the model, which is the regional meteorological data. These data are collected by the weather station. It has two components, surface data and upper air data. The data contains the direction and speed of wind at different elevations. Next, we need to apply the regional terrain data and assign elevation points to the model. This step will transform the model from 2D to 3D. Both meteorological and terrain data have a direct impact on the air dispersion modeling result. Lastly, the building envelope is based on the drawing provided by the facility or from site survey with exact parameters such as building dimensions, heights inputted into the model. This information is used for building downwash analysis and air dispersion modeling. Now, we have built a highly accurate 3D model, which we can see and verify it on Google Earth in 3D. We want to have better inputs because it can give us accurate modeling result. After running the model, we would get modeling results with concentration contours. We can also visualize the concentration contours inside Google Earth in 3D. We can clearly see the location with a higher pollutant concentration. The AirMod model is much more detailed than the previous regulatory model because it is based on various modeling parameters that require significantly more work. It can accurately capture a facility's air emission situation for environmental compliance and many other purposes. We hope you enjoyed this short introductory video on AirMod. Thank you. And to summarize, all plants in Ontario need to be in compliance with Section 20 and a Schedule 3 standards as of February 1st, 2020. And they need to assess their compliance with the new requirements. This assessment can be done by updating the ESTM report or simply running the screening models. And if the POI uh, emissions exceed the ministerial limits, some modification to the operating conditions or to the facility is required. And the plant may need to apply for a new air ECA or ESER permit, depending on the condition. So this concludes this presentation. Now I wanna hand it over to John for Q&A. But before that, I wanna thank my colleague, Ethan Jiao, who helped in this webinar a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Elham, and that, uh, I really like that video. So, okay, I had uh, some questions people gave me. So, hopefully, Paul, you can unmute because some of them apply to you. I'm unmuted. Okay, super. Okay. Um, someone asked about enforcement actions for failing conditions in an ECA. What's your take on that? Is it, oh, there's my dog. Uh, is that, Sorry, I'm trying to talk to my dog for us. Um, would it be a charge or do you think it would be just a director's order or you know a notice from a district officer? What's your opinion on? Well, the, the, the ministry um, uh, have, have uh, a policy for enforcement and it, it's like peeling layers of an onion. So it, it will depend on the seriousness of the offence. It will depend on your past track record. Um, it will, act, but in short, in answer to your question, in most circumstances, I would expect them to serve an order for
for you to come into compliance and uh, less likely, and you know, the order itself may be quite onerous to comply with and you would have to, so perhaps I should just flag here. What do you do if you are enforced against? If you, if you get an order and you don't agree with it, of which let's say for the sake of argument, you don't, uh, you have to take action very, very swiftly. You have days within which to uh, effectively challenge and appeal an order to most likely the Environmental Review Tribunal. So anybody who's listening, if you're getting forced against and you want to appeal, you can't just sit on it and wait for a week to consider it or speak with your lawyer or whatever. You have to literally deal with it on the, on the turn. So let me say that. Um, you could be prosecuted uh, for any of these things because technically they are any contravention of the statute or the regulation or your, the, the conditions of your ECA uh, is or certainly can be an offence and they could prosecute you for the reasons I've said, less likely to do so with an initial or a minor offence, more likely to deal with it by an order. If you don't comply with the order, then they'll move on to the next kind of um, uh, enforcement. And prosecution usually comes lower down the scale. Um, and it depends, you know, what, what you've done. So in a slightly different context, if you've had a spill and you fail to report a spill absolutely immediately to the Spills Action Center, then there's a, there's a, a, a fairly good chance that they will be considering prosecution for the, um, the omission of doing that. Um, similarly, uh, a discharge to the environment that may affect, um, adversely uh, affect environmental interests um, you have to report that. Um, that's not necessarily a spill. Similarly, as I said, pointing to Section 13 of the Environmental Protection Act, you have to report exceedances over re regulatory amounts. So any of these things could land you in some level of, of trouble. Um, I think mainly an order will do it, but occasionally, depending on your circumstance, the, you have to expect the possibility of uh, of a prosecution okay as a follow-up someone asked maybe this is helpful thinking the <laughs> silver lining any loosening of enforcement because of covid have you seen any of that um i haven't I, well actually i was going to turn to elham for this to see if she's had anything come across her desk in terms of uh, enforcement i think I don't think there has been a deliberate uh, hold back in enforcement, but I do think that uh, uh, the circumstances of, um, of, of how uh, social distancing and remote working is affecting everybody has affected the ministry as well. But I don't think, uh, so I think there's been a de facto relaxation, but I don't think you can rely on that. I don't think they've, they've specifically given a, um a go by for for not complying with your uh, your standards i'm not sure elham if you've seen any relaxation in the approach to reporting deadlines or things like that from the ministry during covid so for the ecas i haven't seen any relaxation for mpris uh, ministry extended the deadline for uh, yeah, yeah. reporting but uh, for the ecas no relaxation but uh, I, I may add uh, that the ministry might not uh, visit the facilities more often, uh, but if a facility receives a, a complaint, uh, they will definitely uh, will take care of it uh, immediately. Okay, I have Absolutely. a question. Oh, sorry. I have a question from someone who asks this. Maybe this is another wishful, a bunch of wishful thinking questions. <laughs> Does reg, the Reg 346 model give a more conservative point of impingement number versus uh, the new models that AirMod Screen or ASHRAE under certain cir circumstances? I'm, I'm going to pass that straight to Elham, I think. 
Yes. Uh, so uh, the air I, I can say that the air mod model is more accurate because it considers all the parameters uh, of the stack and the building and the met data and train data. For some cases, uh, might uh, if the stack has a good buoyancy, uh, uh, the air mod model results might be even better than the uh, ORAC 346 okay. model. But yep. uh, in most cases, uh, because the ORAC 346 model is very simple model, it just considers one virtual source, uh, the results might not be very good. Yeah, besides that, I think it's a moot point because you still, you're required by the, by the requirement to do air mods or screen through your ASHRAE. So you just can't rely on not doing those, crossing your fingers and hoping that the point of impingement is more stringent, right? Is that, is that correct? Uh, that is, yeah. uh, that is uh, absolutely right. Yeah. And uh, and the ministry is required to be mm -hmm. uh, under scheduled three standards. And, and the model that is used for this one is AirMod. Okay. Yeah. All right, you don't another have an option. Yeah, you don't have an option. You gotta do it anyway. You don't have an option. Yeah. Okay, here's another question. Someone asked about truck traffic. So it's their understanding truck traffic is required to be included in noise calculations or noise emissions, but is truck traffic required to be included in the air emissions? I will answer this question. So the track, uh, truck traffic uh, definitely uh, will need to be included in the noise reports. But if the truck uh, idles at the, inside the facility, like refrigerated trucks that needs to be idled, then uh, the emissions uh, should be considered in the air emissions as well. Okay. All right, uh, another question is, okay, if, this is a very specific question, but I think it applied anyway. Okay, if you're in an industrial zoned area, like that model there, and then you end up having, for example, a house of worship move in because, and I've seen this, is sometimes in an industrial plaza, they'll let some um, rent into a place for something that wasn't intended use, wasn't an industrial use. Is that considered the point? Do you use that as the point impingement or do you use a point of impingement only for a residential or parkland zoned area. Do you understand the question? Yes, uh, I will answer this one. So the uh, so you're basically talking about the sensitive receptors. So a place of worship in an industrial sector is not a sensitive receptor. But if there is a, a resident uh, residential area mm -hmm. or if there is a hotel in an industrial, uh, sector, it is considered a sensitive receptor. Uh, and the residential areas or hospitals or, uh, or child care facilities, all, all those facilities are considered sensitive receptors. Okay. And the other question is noise update. Is, it, is there a noise update in 2020 similar to the air or no? Like your air noise... Uh... Uh, noise uh, noise requirements didn't change that much. Uh, the, the ministry updated the uh, guidelines, but uh, the requirements didn't change that much, uh, like the air. Yeah. Okay. No, All right. Not been a, yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to, to add in a couple of things. Uh, Elham mentioned earlier that the ministry on whether the ministry had relaxed in its approach that they will always investigate a complaint and just wanted to emphasize that the ministry often treat a complaint as evidence of an adverse environmental impact. So a complaint, stick handling complaints and potential for complaints in your locality is an important thing. And just picking up on the thing we've just discussed about sensitive receptors, I mean, that's precisely why many industries will involve themselves in and vigorously oppose new development where it will introduce a sensitive receptor into their area. Firstly, because of the increased uh, um, regulatory uh, um, demands it may make of them, but also simply on a straightforward nuisance claim. 
if you have a sensitive receptor move in and they make a nuisance claim, then, then that's also an exposure. So that's why facilities and their owners often involve themselves in the, in the planning process for that purpose. Okay, and this is perfect timing because it's 1.02 according to my watch. So, and I said one o'clock, so I'm two minutes late. Uh, that we finish this uh, formal program. So I'd like to thank our speakers, Paul and Elham. I personally thought it was very both entertaining and informative. So I hope the participants did as well. And as a, um, a reminder, this it has been recorded. So if you miss part of it or you want to share this with a colleague, we can send it, the recording to you. I believe we have a YouTube channel. We post it on our YouTube channel. I'll double check that. We'll put it in our email we send to you. And as well as the slides themselves, we can share with anyone who would like a copy. Uh, other than that, have a great November 18th. Um, and um, take care, everybody. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.